I love Ascension Lutheran Church. I do. And I know when I say that I love the church, it certainly means the individual people you gathered here. But when I say that, I'm meaning all of us together and what we do together. We have such amazing musicians here on this campus, the Mercers. Yeah, I love them. And, and, and Chad in the morning with all the people that they add to the worship. And then over at Tyler, we've got, oh my goodness, organists and pianists, choirs, brass, bells, strings, and, and, and just everything comes together and our worship is just amazing. But we also have a real passion for our young people and we really want them to grow up in the faith and the love and knowledge of God. And so from the time they're baptized, we're following them up with showing their parents how to help them grow in the faith. It's why we built this place, a daycare, so that we can share Jesus with the infants on up. And then our Tyler Preschool, when they're a little older, we can really help them know Jesus. And of course, Sunday School and our G-Force Midweek and Vacation Bible Schools, our college age group. And the way we care for one another especially when we're going through a tough time. We have people trained as Stephen ministers to walk and to pray with us. But, you know, it's, it's amazing just the new things that keep coming out. So many of you are going out twice a month in pairs just to visit the membership of the congregation that, for whatever reason, aren't able to come, aren't quite as active anymore, taking a little bit of food and a whole lot of joy. And it just makes the day. It's, it's awesome. I love that. But at our core, we're an outreach congregation. From our history on back, we've been supporting missionaries. If for those of you that have been here a while, you know missionary Isaac. He was, he was a lay person. We, we helped train up as a pastor. He started congregation after congregation in Ghana. And, and then in, more recently in Guinea, we, we helped the Eddings and the Heinies start Congregation after congregation. Pastor Mike took two teams, or will be taking two teams now to Tanzania. We've helped build a church there. Baptized hundreds of people there. We have active missionaries right now in India. We built a daycare in Brazil, in a favela, a slum. We, we helped support Holy Trinity Orphanage and Old Age Home in Brazil. And we've started two campuses. Now the third one we're getting ready to birth off into Pratt as, as a brand new congregation, a restart. And How many vicars have we trained and now are serving in multiple congregations? From, from our quilting group on Wednesday to our crochet prayer shawl makers to LWML to our fellowship for guys, I love ascension. And when you love someone, you tend to overlook the flaws. You know what I'm saying? You know, because there's just so much passion and personal investment in the relationship, be it, you know, your family, your spouse, or congregation, you, you tend to not look at the hard areas and have an honest discussion because it's so fraught with troubles and perils. I mean, someone's feelings is going to get hurt. You know, and misunderstandings. I thought you loved me. I do. But we need to talk. Oh. You know when you're in a relationship and someone says, we need to talk, mm, that's never good, is it? You know, the, the, the big stuff's going to come out now. It's all going to be out there, exposed stuff that we haven't talked about, but need to talk about. So, so yes, in the next five weeks, it's not going to be an easy sermon series. And it, because it's a call to Repentance. And by its very nature, a call to repentance creates in us a certain offense. What do you mean? What's wrong with me? You know? It it is offensive. And so we tend to like to shoot the messenger and uh, deny the facts. Uh, Or when we we admit, okay, you're right, you're right, and then we start wringing our hands. What are we going to do? It's hopeless. We're never going to change. Take a deep breath, people. Okay. We're going to be okay. Because this path of repentance, this call to repentance, is also the path of faith and new life with Jesus. 
Of course it's not easy because it is a death to what we have been doing. The old way of life, but then there is a new way of life given as a gift of grace by Jesus. And so as we move forward then, knowing it's going to be difficult, you might in the back of your mind still have some suspicions. Wait a minute, can... Can we trust the messenger and the message? Because pastors, they get all excited about stuff. You know, they read a book. You know, oh boy, here it comes. You know, we'll just kind of ride this one out. How do we know that this is not just a pet project of a pastor, but really has the hand of God? Well, okay, I hear you. So we're going to move forward in these next weeks with a healthy skepticism. Mm -hmm. In that, I don't want you to believe a word that I tell you. But I don't want you to disbelieve it either. For now, just listen. Take it in. And, and as you take it in, I'm asking you to be active listeners, which requires effort, I know, and prayer. Pray that you would have eyes to see and ears to hear what is true and evident and reality and not what we wish was or what I prefer. Pray that you would have the ability to understand what's being shared. Because if you don't understand what's happening in these next five weeks, it's going nowhere. But above all, pray that you would have a, a renewed desire and passion within your heart to know God, to be with Him, and that He be everything to you. So if you're willing to be that kind of active listener and prayer, here we go. Today's topic is the church. What is it? What it's not? What it's become and what it could be? Because when you hear the word church, it's natural that we all have in mind what you're in right now, what, what you went to church, right? You're here. And when you, when you go to church, what do you hope happens there but good things? You know, we really want some nice music. Okay, we really want, we want people to be nice to us and, and genuinely care about us. But it's not just a social event either. We come here to be fed deeply, richly, fed in our souls and if all of those things are coming together like, yeah, I like this church so much better than my old church, right? Or, or if maybe Ascension's not getting it done for you and you're thinking of shopping, you know, maybe there is that church out there that's going to feed me a little better. And, and you know what? We churches know that about you. I know. And so we try very hard then to you know, uh, market ourselves and be appealing so that the consumers of religious goods and services will find this place to be attractive so that church is good. Now, hopefully some of you are smirking a bit going, well, that ain't right. He said not to believe stuff. I think I'm starting with that. Okay, because that's not... This is where we have to start because whether we want to admit it or not, most people think of church as something you go to, and if it's not good, we're not happy. But it wasn't this way immediately after the first, uh, immediately after the resurrection of Jesus, for those first Christians. For the early Christians, after that first Easter, it wasn't like this at all. Now, I know that the early Christians were hardly a perfect bunch of people, I mean, it's well documented in the New Testament what a messed up place they were. I mean, you look at Corinthians, Galatians, the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Not good. Okay, so, so this call to repentance for ascension isn't, well, let's look at what the early church did and then do that. You know, after all, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to prayer they, they, they held everything in common and met in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. No, the reason God added to their numbers daily wasn't because they got it right, and we sadly don't. No, what I want you to do is look at what the early church was doing and ask a very simple question. Why did they do that? Think 
think of a group of people who have at least as much selfishness and greed inside of them as you do. Why on earth would they sell their businesses, their homes, their farms, bring all that money, put it together, and then give it to anyone who had need? What would have had to happen in your life for you to be that kind of person? That, that's a very curious question. Why did people who have even smaller homes with no running water or toilets, why would people who have even less disposable time and income and less freedom to do whatever they wanted, why would they give up very precious family time Time doing whatever they wanted to do, their personal projects and sporting events, which they had back then. Why would they give all of that up so that they could meet daily to listen to the apostles talk about Jesus and pray and then go back, gather in their homes with slaves, prostitutes, tax collectors, other notorious sinners whom they now called their dear brothers and sisters in Christ. What kind of church were they going to? What kind of sermon were they hearing? Was it because the youth group was just that amazing? Were their mission trips just that exciting? I mean, think about it. Why would people who love life just as much as you do and their families just as much as you do, why would they be willing to become martyrs, giving up their lives rather than turning away from the church? Very curious questions. For these people, church was not something that they went to or an institution or something that happened inside a building. For them, they themselves were the church. They were a gathering of people who had been completely and radically changed. They had a, a, a radical takeover of ownership of who they are and what they did, and it changed completely how they thought and obviously how they acted. Now, these people at one time were just as much uh, taken in by the technology of their day, just as much consumed about making money and being great, just as much tempted by sex and success as any one of us, but they died to their old way of life and were given a new way of life by this man who was going from town to town and he was preaching a very simple message. Repent, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This man, Jesus, was more than just a preacher saying, hey, there's a new thing out there, better give it a try. Hey, here's some wisdom you ought to live by. There were a lot of people giving a lot of wisdom even back then. What Jesus came and offered and the, and the truth of it was verified in the healings and the resurrections and all of the miracles around him that what was now available was a welcome into God's family. And not just, hey, you're in someday, but hey, you're in now. And God himself comes to live in you. See, that's what made them a temple, a living stone of the church. God himself dwelt in them. Jesus dwelled in them and delighted in them. And now it reordered their thinking and acting and it moved them. And the whole world took notice of how they loved, how their lives were very good and at peace and rest and we could even kill them and they wouldn't give it up. As we look at them and now we look at ourselves, we ask the same question, why do we do what we do? And why do we not do what we do? What they did. See that? All of that really comes back to what, what's going on inside. How do we know if, if I'm part of, of this movement or if I'm just going to church? Well, there's, there's some little tests that you can kind of evaluate yourself. But, and, and I just want to caution you. 
This isn't about looking at yourself to see, well, would I be willing to give up some money or even all of my money? Well, gosh, I, I don't know if I could do that, but I probably, I probably need to do that. I need to do better at that. Or, or gosh, I, I probably should be better at gathering together and having that. See, it's not about looking at what they did and trying to imitate it. That's something that happened because of a change inside. So we're going to look inside each one of us. And you're going to be looking at your desires and your fears. And the first thing I want you to look at is, well, what, what do you want more than anything else? Well, what's that, that highest thing that you've got to have? Nothing else will do. And then its opposite is, what do you fear and try to avoid like the plague? It's like, oh man, if that happens, it's all over. It's all gone if I lose that. And what is it that, that really comforts and secures your heart? Like, if, if this is there, it doesn't matter. Everything else can be flying to pieces. I'm at comfort. I'm at peace and rest. What is it that gives you great uh, um, happiness and joy in the bones of your body? It's like, this is, it's just through and through joy. And finally, what can you go without even if everything else is gone? I just cannot go without this. Now this is a pretty high bar, isn't it? It's like, oh, wow. But there is something for each and every person in this room. There is something at that highest bar that says, this is it. This is the thing. And as you look at that, what, what is that? We find, well, if that high bar is Jesus, well, then you find that you are no longer a slave to your money. And that uh, there is this generosity that truly wells up within you because you're no longer looking to your money for significance or security or your happiness or your goodness or what you can do with power. But now you see it as a resource that, well, God may need, and, and you may need this, so here you go. There, it's just a natural generosity. It's never forced. You, you could never hear a sermon that could produce you enough guilt and obligation to do that as if Jesus were at that top spot in your life. If Jesus is that top spot in your life, then you will find that then that, that gathering with other Jesus followers becomes an extremely high priority for you. Higher than your, your business, your hobbies. And you find then that, well, the, the religious practice of, of just your private prayer and devotional life and your corporate worship and religious activities become extremely important. Not because you, you do them to be religious, but you do them to maintain and enhance this relationship with Jesus who is in you and he's your everything. If Jesus is that, that high mark and bar on your life, you'll find that your personal life really changes from a self-focus and a self-interest. And you can see it in your sex life. And that it's really transformed in the purity of your thoughts and your actions. And you can really see it where you spend most of your time and that's at work. And that your work is no longer a means to your ends of fulfilling anything other than the glory of God. I am serving with all of my gifts and whatever I do because Jesus is that high mark in my life. If he's there, then the church, you stop going to church because you are the church. So how does this call to repentance land and then produce the change? How does this invitation then instill in you that kind of Jesus, you're thy high mark? Well, if you're an active listener and then you have eyes to see and you have ears to hear, you find it very convicting because you, like me, realize that Jesus is nowhere close to that spot. And then you find within you, uh, you kind of understand that that is a better way of life. And, and rather than just wringing your hands of how hopeless it all is and you know yourself and there's no way you're going to 
You're going to really ever change from that. Your hands are out to Jesus. And he takes your hand, even right now, and he holds it very gently. And he says, I invite you into our family. I, the Father and the Holy Spirit, we come and we live in you. Sins forgiven, new life given. We come and we make our home in you and all that you've heard of what can and will be, it, this movement moves into you. And this movement, the more and more of this congregation that has this movement, we all become a movement of the goodness and the glory and the love and forgiveness of God in our community. If even just this many people had a heart that Jesus, you and you alone are my Lord, my Savior, my friend, my teacher, my mentor, and I, your apprentice. I mean, Jesus did a lot with 12 people. So, what I want to give to you, first of all, is the really good news that Jesus said. He said, it's here. It's here. You don't have to do anything more. His cross, his resurrection has provided everything. He knows how to change your heart. He knows how to give you this new life. That's what baptism has brought into you. And now, this practice of faith, I'm going to give you a card to take home. If you don't get one, it'll be on the website. It's a question and a prayer. Because the question is, am I putting myself in a place where the Holy Spirit can be working in me faith and love for God and love for other people. And it's, it's a regular question. Am I putting myself in the place? It, there, there's an effort to this. You won't drift into this. Am I putting myself in that place? Th this is one of the places, but it's also a mindset. It's a prayer set. It's a daily Jesus. It's a seeking of him and his kingdom and his righteousness. And then the prayer... Is Jesus lead me, Jesus lead me in a life where I am the church. I invite you to continue the walk with us in the next four weeks. But if you are the church, and you are, then you are a movement. And we're moving in the direction that God is leading. To him alone be all glory and honor and praise. Amen.